Good morning. It is good to see you here this morning. It's good to have you here with us. If you will, be open your Bibles to the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 2 will be our starting point for our lesson this morning. Should I start over? Just kidding. This is Valentine's Day weekend, and so some of you are already, already chuckling. It's okay. Um, this is Valentine's Day weekend. And so Valentine's Day obviously brings about thoughts of love. And Valentine's Day means a lot to different people. And so this morning I thought what we would do is, is talk a little bit about that. Really talk about um, love and uh, different kinds of love that we would like to share. And talk about this morning as part of our, as part of our lesson uh, today. I think there's different kinds of love. There's different kinds of things that you can love. Okay, you can love people. You can love a husband. Can love his wife. A um, a set of parents can love their children. Hopefully, children love their parents. Um, as as a church, we are to love one another. We are told that we are commanded to love one another. But then we get into the real important things, and some people may say, well, you know what, I really love ice cream, or ice cream's important to me. Um, I love, this sounds weird, I love peanut butter and jelly, okay? Let's go with the creamy peanut butter, not the, the, the peanuts in there. Let's not crunch it up. Let's make it smooth and silk, okay? Very important when you get into the big connoisseur of peanut butter and jelly, okay? Uh, when it comes to things that you love, you want to make sure that, that it is understood what you love and why you love it. We live in uh, the great state of Alabama. We live amongst people who love their sports, love their teams. In this state of Alabama, we don't understand what professional sports is. Professional sports for us is on a college level. So um, you have your team. So that's okay. You love your team. Uh, I once heard of, uh, on the radio, they were talking about how important, how interesting it was that people talk about the we, the us, the ours, yet they've never put on the pads. But it's, they're still their team. They choose their team. You choose that situation. You commit to that situation. You're going to be a part of it. It's just the way it is. And that's okay. No, no, no complaints here. Have your team. That is truly, truly important. It's about what you love. It's about things that you love. So from the biblical perspective, we want to talk about, I love my church. Paul, the apostle, in talking to the church, um, mentioned about how that I love my gospel. Paul didn't didn't write the gospel, okay? He didn't write any of them. Um, he didn't inspire them. He didn't author them. But he still mentions it as my gospel. We'll talk more about that, about that in just a little bit. But we start here in Revelation chapter 1, I mean, chapter 2, starting in verse 1 through verse 5. And we look at this passage. We look at what's happening here. Uh, Jesus is addressing the seven churches of Asia. If you remember, what, six months to about a year ago, we did a series on the seven churches of Asia. The first of which was the church in Ephesus. Ephesus had a lot going on. And Ephesus was known for being a large congregation, a large church, about 50,000 members. Big church. And so um, Jesus is addressing them and he talks to them. He, he begins this in chapter 2, starting in verse 1. So what I want you to do is follow along with me as we notice the tone of the conversation will change after verse 3. But let's start in verse 1 of chapter 2. He said, to the angel of the church of Ephesus write, these things says he who holds the seven stars in the right hand and walks, notice this, walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. That is verse 1. The golden lampstand being lit represents faithfulness. So Jesus is, is talking to the church of Ephesus about their faithfulness. That's what the discussion is about. That's this conversation. He's like, you're good. Okay, stars in right hand. You have the golden lampstands. They're lit up. Things are good. Verse 2 tells us, I know your works. I know your labor. I know your patience and that you cannot bear those who are evil. So let's break that down for a second. What Jesus is saying is, I know what you're doing. I know the work you do. And what I want you to do right now, this is me, Paul, talking to Palisades. I want you to think about Palisades as we read this. Very important. 
All right? But when Jesus says to Ephesus, he says, he says, I know your works, I know your labor, I know what you do. I understand what's going on. And, and we're not hiding anything from Jesus. He knows what goes on both with Ephesus and with us. He knows what's going on. Okay? We can't hide from him, hide from our Lord. But he sees this and he recognizes this. I think that's what's important. But as he says, you've been tested by those who say they're apostles, but are not. And they are found to be liars. And so what Jesus is recognizing here in this passage, he notices that you are aware, that you bear and understand that you're bearing the, 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 um, the situation of some people are saying they're faithful, saying that they are, they are apostles, and they're not. They're liars. They're false teachers. And verse 3 tells us, and you have um, persevered, you have had patience, and you've labored for my name's sake, and have not become weary. You see, it's important to understand that Jesus is lifting up the church in Ephesus in this point in this conversation. He said, you've done all these things. You've dealt with these situations. You've done pretty well so far. And the conversation looks like it's going pretty well right now. And Jesus is sharing this, this, this sentiment. That look at all the things you've done. But then we go into verse 4. We look at verse 4, and at this point in time, we understand things change a little bit. The tone of Jesus changes a little bit with the word nevertheless. Let me define for you what nevertheless means. Nevertheless means even though you did cool here, guess what? Over here, not so good. <laughs> okay, so sorry, you did okay here. You did all right. You started out doing well, but over here we have something a little different, so let's share this with you. All right, nevertheless, I have this against you that you have left your first love. You've left your first love. Who's my first love? My first love is my Lord, my Lord, my church, my people. You, you were doing well. You were on the road. You were doing great things. You were encouraging people on what you were doing. But all of a sudden, nevertheless, even though you did that good, you turned your back on the church. You turned your back on the Lord. And how are we going to deal with that? In verse 5, he says, remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Repent and do the first works. He's saying, do you remember back in verse 1 through verse 3? Do you remember our conversation when I kind of lifted you up for all the good things you did? You know, you, 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 I knew your works. I know you labored. You did things. I recognize your patience. I recognize your perseverance. I, I got the fact that you're dealing with some things. And, and I understand that. People are saying they're apostles. They're not really. They're teaching. They say they're teachers. They're not really teachers. False teachers, you're dealing with that. You did fine with that. But do you remember when you look back when your, things were good? So for you, person who loves God, or else you wouldn't be here, I want you to ask yourself this question. And don't think I'm saying we're all Ephesus. We're not, okay? But I want you to ask yourself this question. Have you ever been in a situation where you've looked back and you've noticed, I really remember when things were really good. I really remember when things were going really good spiritually and I had everything going right. I was taking the right kind of steps. I was as involved as I could. I worked where I could. I did all the things that I could do within the ability that God has given to me. And that's a lot. Okay, that's a lot. We have people, even in this building now, who are dealing with stuff. Sometimes dealing with pain. Yet they worship God anyway. They come with God's people anyway. Okay, a lot of things going on in the world. We don't have no idea what's going on. You may look to the right, look to the left, and ask yourself, hmm, wonder what's going on with them. Trust me, there's something. And that's why we're here. That's why we're part of God's family. Because we get to go somewhere where everything can be fixed. Where we can do stuff. Where we can get that encouragement and get that help. What, he's, what Jesus is telling the church in Ephesus here, he's basically saying, do you remember when things were good? Let's go back to that day and think about that day. Because you and I have friends. We have people that we love dearly. That we need to ask that question. Do you remember when things were good? What can we do? What can the Lord do? What can we read? What can we study? How can we pray? What can we say to bring you back to that good place? And so Jesus is looking at them. He's basically telling them, he says, repent and do the first works. He's saying, get back to the basics. Get back to what brought you here. Let's talk about the things, the foundational things that make church, church. The, th the reason why I love my church and the things that bring us to that point in time. He says, I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from this place unless you repent. Remember the lampstands? The golden lampstands that were all lit up for faithfulness? Guess what? Those are out. 
If I become unfaithful, nobody wants a lamp stand out. Light them up, folks. Light them up and be faithful for the Lord. That's what we're talking about here. I love my church. Do you love your church? And let's talk about that. So for a moment, I want you to indulge me with something that, that I've never done before and never done it here. But I have, a, I have a logo. I have something that I have had have held on to this for 10 years, and I'm finally able to use it. Have you ever asked yourself what the Palisades logo stands for? Have you? Don, Don knows. He's sitting here thinking, I got this answer. I put this on Facebook. I put this on Facebook thinking I get all kinds of folks that would give us their ideas. I probably should have posted it on my page so people that don't go to church can say stuff and just see what they say. I may do that anyway. That'll be fun. I'll report back to you next week how that goes. But um, our good brother, Gary Raspberry, got up there and specifically gave the details of exactly what it was. Like, thanks, Gary. That was awesome. And it was. It was really good. And I'm not going to ask for a raise of hands, but I want you to think just for a moment. Do you know the purpose and the point of every piece of the logo of this church? You see, the colors, and if I was to tell you the colors, you would laugh at me. I am colorblind. Um, I think the P, the P, the P, I think the P is purple. I think the A is a sky blue. The, the um, L is a yellow. The I, maybe a dark purple. The S, maybe a light purple. Maybe the A is a greenish thing. Maybe S is the green. I'm confused by that. You see that? Okay. I'm colorblind. It's okay. It's okay. I taste wonderfully. I smell wonderfully. So the other stuff's going just fine. Um, but the Palisades has different colors almost for every letter in that word. And what that represents is two things. Did you know that? You probably think it's just one thing. It's two things. Number one, it represents the people who live in our community. Do you know that? See, you would have thought it's the people who are sitting inside this building. Not so much. I mean, it is. It is definitely. We'll get to that. But the first basic reason for this, I think the purpose of this, of Palisades, the colors, is because we live, this building sits in a community with diversity. And thank God for that. Thank God for that. A bigger and better blessing, a better blessing than the fact that we live in a community. We have people from all kinds of cultures, some speaking different languages, and that's okay. We're good with that, okay, and different backgrounds. We look at that logo. We look at the colors that represent the people, the good, good people in this room, the members of this church that represents different, in other countries would say, different nationalities of the world in our own building. I've been places where nationalities, 50 nationalities were represented. And I'm pretty sure we're close to that in this room when you think about it. There is something special to embrace the diversity that we have here. Because as diverse as you, you may look around to the right, to the left, see folks that look a little different than you, and that's okay. It's not scary. It's a blessing. It's good because one day when we're with God, with that church we love in heaven, guess what? It's not going to matter about the colors because we're all the same. God made us all the same. And we're all going to be a part of that church that we get to love, the church I love where it's okay. Okay? It's good. Let's go forward. So I call it the blip, the talking blip. Is that, is that wrong? Um, let's just go with that. Okay, the talking blip, you have the little, uh, it looks like a P which I honestly, honestly didn't even notice that or think about that until Gary mentioned it, so thank you for that. It's a P, but it's also a talking blip. And inside that is a cross. And so what that means is these people, these wonderful people, a part of this diversity in this church is talking about the cross. That's what we're doing. These people are talking about the cross. Our logo, folks, members and visitors alike, our logo preaches its own sermon. Preaches its own sermon. Because it tells us what we need to do is, no matter where we come from, no matter where, where, where we, we're going, no matter how tall we are, how short we are, no matter what kind of car I drive, no matter what my house is, guess what? We're one. We are the church. We're one. And we have a blessing to be here. Some would say, it's not a blessing to be here. I think it is. 
I think here is where we are as a church. And we need to learn to love our church. And that's what it is. Now, this morning we're going to talk about the church universally. We love the church universally. We love the church that, that Jesus established. In Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18, he was talking to Peter. He said, upon this rock I will build my church. Jesus established that. My church, of course church. He's, he's showing possession here because Jesus died for this church. Jesus died for this opportunity we have to be able to be here today. And as Dr. Dodd so in such an awesome way mentioned and talked about how that this is the purpose. This is the point. To gather on this table, recognize who Jesus is, what his body means to us, and thank you, God. I'm sorry, but thank you, God, for allowing your son's blood to be shed on that cross. Thank you for that. So we get in that situation where we think about that, and, and, and it, it's a church. It's a happy story. I don't want you to leave here thinking, oh, that was such a, such a tough sermon to listen to. Don't think that at all. This is a happy story, and it's got a happy ending. And I can't wait for it. Can you? Can you wait for the happy ending? I'm ready. Let's go right now. Let's go. All right? And it's about loving our church. But until we get there, what are we going to do now? What are we, myself, you, what are we going to do now? Because if I love my church, I'm going to live for my church. I'm going to love my church better than my team. Better than my town. It's a cool town. I get it. Better than they might fill in the blank. All right? It's our church, and that's something that we need to understand. We need to, we need to follow through with. So you see, there's two things we need to do. Two things anybody, any church has to do to revitalize or to refresh or to put ourselves to renew in a situation to love our church. So we got two things. You have to, number one, believe. Number two, sorry. Number two, practice. You have to believe and you have to practice. So we start here with the fact that I need to relish the local church. I need to relish the local church. But I want you to go back for a minute think about this with me. Believe and practice. Do you believe this is the best place to be at? I think it is. There is something in the air at this place of people that just love each other. And it's, it's really hard for a person to walk through the door and not be greeted. I mean, obviously, we have the world's best greeters. We just do. It's just, that's the way it is. But among that, you, you get past our greeters, you come to the door, and you got more people. You, you get past the door, you try to find a pew, and you're going to find more people. And we seem to love each other. It's just it's a great atmosphere. It's, a, it's, it's an infectious atmosphere. But we need to take the fact that we relish the church here in our communities. Okay? To our work to our school, to opportunities to be able to share and to love Jesus because Jesus loved the church. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 1, Paul is talking to the church in Corinth. And he says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. We need to imitate and do what Paul did. Let's, let's imitate Jesus. Let's be like Christ. Jesus loved the church. Not only did he believe he loved the church, he practiced it. He had followers, disciples, apostles. That did things because that's what Jesus did. And they believed in him. They believed in the church. They believed in God. They not only believed it, but they practiced it. So keep those two words in mind as we go through this lesson this morning. Not only they believe it, they practiced it. Jesus loves the church. In Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 25, we show another point where Jesus says that he loves the church. Ephesians 5, 25, husbands love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and he gave himself up for her. So when you think about loving the church, it's not just about the church universally. My question this morning is, do you love Palisades? Do you love Palisades? Because it's just like a team. It's better than a team because this is our team, right? We love it. Be proud of it and share it with other people. It's a truthful situation and we need to keep in mind. And, and usually we get in situations in life where we, we, we feel like if I lived, if I went over there to so-and-so, I could really do some good ministry. If I was over there, I could really do some good things. So the problem is, is uh, we try to be happy in two situations. In two situations, you know where that is or what that is? Some other place and some other time. Some other place 
at some other time. You know, if this was another year, another time, I really think I probably could really do some good work for Jesus. I could do some good things. It's like, it's like wasting your life away, wishing your life away. Growing up, I couldn't wait till I was 12. I don't know why I was 12. Uh, I guess because it wasn't 11. And so I was really excited for it. Then it was 13 because I was a teenager and really nothing changed except I was just a year older. What a big deal. Um, then I thought 16 is it. When I turn 16, life is going to be good. I'll have a car. I'll have my license. You know, it doesn't always work in that order. Things happen. Whatevs. So we, we continue with life. I said, you know what? I'm going to graduate high school one day, and everything's going to be great. I can really do some good things then when I graduate high school. So, so I graduate high school, and then you got to go to college. you got to go to school. Uh, you know, it's a good thing. Education's awesome. I love it. Let's do that. Go to college. And then I said, you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to join the Navy. Let's do that. Let's, let's, let's do that some. I can't wait to do this, and, and things will be just right. It'll be just right. I get out of the Navy. You know what? I can't wait till I get married. I get married and life's going to be great. It's going to be awesome, which it is. It is awesome. It's so good. It's so good. Oh, it's so good. Okay. But, but, but you know, you, you wish your life away to a certain point and you're like, okay, we're married. You know, I can't wait to have kids. I can't wait. You know, Stephanie and I waited 10 years to have kids. 10 years. You know, it is what it is. Okay. But I'm so glad we have kids. So glad we have kids. So glad, Lainey. So glad. Okay, so, so, um, so it's good. Both of them, and Tyler, you know, I love them both. They're awesome. They're different, but I love them, okay? You know, they're our kids, right? But then, then uh, you know, you keep thinking this, and let's, 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 let's face it. Sometimes we're going to wish our life away to a point in which I think I'm really going to be able to do ministry now. You know, now I can really do it because I finally got to that place. I finally got to that spot in my life where I can do it. We need to relish the church. We need to love the church as Jesus loved the church. Because he told us specifically, he says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Let's follow Paul's, Paul's way of doing things. Let's love it. Love the church. And that's something we need to consider and continue to think about as we, as we go on through our life. Let's not wait for the right time because the right time is here. The right time is now. This is it. This is that opportunity. Because I'm telling you, you cannot walk back and forth this building a couple of times without realizing there's work to be done. There's things we can do. There's plenty of room for growth. Plenty of, plenty of opportunity to do some stuff. But it really comes down to your choice and mine. When are we going to start doing those things? Because if you relish that church, you're going to rep that church, right? You're going to represent. You're going to do some things. There is no retirement from church work. There is no, I'm through and I, I'm done. I've done my time and there's more can, that can do that. Our time is done when God says so. You know, and I even think at that point in heaven, I think we still get to do stuff. So, so I don't think there's ever a time we don't serve God. It's about doing. And so I'm going to ask this question again, please no raise hands. Don't say anything. I want you to think about this outside this building. When was the last time you mentioned the word Palisades to another person? Mm -hmm. Let's ask ourselves that question. Because if you relish the church, you're going to share that. You're going to talk about passage because you love it so much. Because these people love it. They do. We do. And there's so many cool things that we can do and, and, and be a part of. And I'm going to tell you right now, quick plug, connection minister, quick plug time. Hope it's okay. But no time out. This is the truth. We have door hangers. Next month, our service day, we're going to be in our community hanging those doors and starting conversations of Bible studies with people in our community. There's no better time than now. This sounds like an invitation. I'm not done yet. I'm sorry. But, but there's no better time to know this is what I can do. You know, people say door knocking scares folks. I'm not going to ask you to knock on your door. Just take that little door, door hanger and just put it on that doorknob and just step back and walk. And there's a phone number and an email address. If they have a question, just send it. Let's talk to you. It's going to work. It's going to happen. But we got to work together to make it happen. And that's where we are. Is about enjoying it. So the, the text that he t shows us here in, in, uh, in chapter 2, verse 4, he says, Nevertheless, I have this against you. And Jesus talking to the church there. He says that you left your first love. So the best way to show and to relish the church is to remain faithful and loving him. Number two, you need to recommend your local church. If you're a member here at Palisades, I ask you and encourage you to recommend this church if your membership is somewhere else, do you love your church enough to recommend it? This is for everybody. 
recommend your local church. If you love the church, you should be excited about the church and excited about Jesus, excited about Christ, excited about what he's done for us and what else he will do for us. But it's going to be difficult for him to do for us if we don't do for him. And that's where we are and that's what we need to do. So Paul the Apostle, what he did is three times in the New Testament, he used the word my gospel. Because it used to, back in the day, when you say, uh, would you have to go with me to my church? And people just kind of scolded you for that. It's not your church. It's not your church. It's God's church. I'm like, of course it's God's church. <laughs> it is God's church. Absolutely it's God's church. And yes, it's Jesus' church. He died for it. But guess what? The body of Christ, us, we're a part of that church. And that's my team. My church. The one that my Savior died for. The one that my Father created all things. And I get to be a part of that. But three times in the New Testament, Paul the Apostle used the words, my gospel. And, um, and he didn't write the gospels. He wasn't author of any of them, okay? But I want you to look at this, of the four, when I say gospels. Don't misunderstand me on that. Uh, we start in Romans chapter 2, verse 16. Romans chapter 2 and verse 16, he said, On that day, when according to, the, to my gospel, he said, According to my gospel, God judges the secrets of men by Christ Jesus. My gospel. In Romans chapter 16 and verse 25. Romans 16 and verse 25. Now to him who is able to strengthen you, okay? Now to him who is able to strengthen you, and according to my gospel... Brings you the preaching and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery that is kept secret of long ages. And then in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 8, not listed on the PowerPoint, but I just want to share this with you again. As he talks to, Peter, to, to Timothy, he says, Remember Christ Jesus, risen from the dead of the offspring of David, as preached in my gospel. Did Paul die for the gospel? He sure did. Did Paul write the gospels? Did he author them? He did not. Inspired by God. He was able to put his pen to that, that parchment to give us what we have today. But we, we actually go back to the situation where we talk about recommending our church and being a part of that. First Peter gives us a good, good analogy when we look at this. In 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 10, he says, As each, of, each one of you have received a gift, because he's giving gifts to us, God gives gifts to us, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. He's given us gifts. He's given us things to help us, to encourage us, and we all need to use these gifts. And these gifts start out by telling us we need to move from spectator to participator. Stop watching. Stop being on the sidelines. We want to give everybody the ball. It's time for everybody to be a part of it. I want you to do that. Because if I relish my church, and if I recommend my church, it's easy for me to say, I love my church. If you're visiting with us this morning, just passing through, I hope you'll take this message home with you. If you're from this community and you're looking for a church home, congratulations, you just found it. This is it. Jesus died for my church. Jesus allowed his body to be hung from the cross and his blood to fall from it. I will say this, there are things in your life and you will ask yourself over and over again, why, why? There is a reason and a purpose for all things. Things happen for a reason. And sometimes the good will, will go through life and have hard times. And sometimes you wonder why the bad always seem to, to, to get all the, the glory and get all the, all the accolades. But I promise you, one day, folks, one day, God is going to balance the books. One day, God will even all the odds and he's going to make it all make sense. But I've got to live for him today. I've got to love my church, his church today. And be a part of that. Before I can enjoy the opportunity for everything one day to always make sense. And it's going to. And it does. 
Because God is in control. Allow him to be in control in your life. Allow him to be a part of what you have, the, the situation you're dealing with. There are people in this room that are not Christians. And so I ask you the question, do you believe? He goes back to that thing, believe and practice. Do you believe this? Do you relish your church? Are you willing to recommend your church? Because relishing is one thing, recommending it's another. Believe and practice. If you haven't been baptized for remission of your sins, now is that time to make it happen. The water's ready. We're ready. It's the Lord's invitation. We ask you to answer it. Because if you believe in him, why not? Repent of your past sins. Confess that Jesus is the Son of God and be immersed. And there's a lot of folks here who are Christians. A lot of us here, majority of us, the family of God can say, I love my church. But if for some reason things haven't gone the way you want them to, maybe you haven't been uh, working or being a part of it as, as we have. Maybe you believe it. Maybe we have been practicing it. Whatever that change is, make that change happen right now as together we stand and sing.